function of physics? I, there's this physics explanation for why the lower you make a note, the less you can perceive the loudness of it. But I don't know what the physics explanation is. Let's go higher. It's still not much higher. It still just sounds like whirr. This is this is this is Terry's worst day turned into a song. Which I we, you have a choice. We have two th- we have two topics. One's going to be this episode. One's going to be the next episode. I want you to pick between. Are we talking about um, measures and metrics? which also includes sort of talking about tools or do you want to talk about distractions and disruption to your discipline? Um, I want to do measures and metrics mostly because I heard the word tools and I want to, I want to, I want to learn. I want to publicly learn. I want tools that can help with my organization. Okay. Here's what I did during the the shortly before the pandemic, I started buying this really expensive journal I mean, it's not expensive compared to like a gym membership this is a quarter's worth of notes and by the way there's a, a surprise ending so this is this is the habit planner it's hard bound i would put nice acrylic paint on the cover i would write my name and a reward if found and then I'd fill it out and it goes it's like a month section you can't see it so i'm not gonna hold it up it's like a month section and then basically like the main chunk would be this daily this daily rundown. So each day you've kind of got like your checklist of most important things, uh, notes for the day. And then over here, you got got like your takeaways from the day and your little smiley emojis for how you felt about that day. Right. So this was a daily goal setting tasks and reflection exercise. And this particular edition was August to October, 2022. So about a year ago. However, the end of this book is is empty because <laughs> I just stopped doing it. So I want a digital version of that. Yeah, that, so that's the answer. I think that the, the reason I liked the hardcover was it was two or threefold. There are a couple different pieces to this. So first, there's the fact that you can hold it, and I liked that. So this was my, this was my you know, comfort, my comfort journal that I had with me at all times. And that was something I did for a long time before, like before the iPad was invented, I would just carry a notebook into all meetings and my meeting flow at work in an office was write down notes from what happened. I never went and looked at these. These were, these were help me remember it now and not help me remember it later. But then I would also put a little box and this is an action item with a date that's due, who it's due to. So I would have Notes I never looked at, then item with a box was, this is a thing that is due to somebody at some time. And that was, I put zero thought into that system. It was what my boss did. It was what the people to my left and to my right did. It was basically innate to that company at that time. And I just did what everybody else did. And it was basically whatever piece of paper or notebook I had handy. That was almost, that was more than 15 years ago now. And the wanting to carry a physical notebook stuck with me because it means that you kind of have like your life is right there and not in the phone sense because you carry your phone. Yeah, sure. Your life is right there with you, but all this other extraneous nonsense is also with you. And it just really cheapens the fact that I don't want to have all of the internet right next to my, my most important life, my core, you know what I'm saying? Well, plus it's bad for you. I mean, you mean like, like holding it next to you or looking at yeah, it? Yeah, carrying your phone in your pocket or God forbid. I can, I can actually carry it right here so that I get good, those waves good. as close as possible <laughs> to the brain. Good. That's that's a, that's a healthy, man, that's discipline. I, I respect it. Uh, do you ever get phone neck where you, you, you realize your neck is hurting from, from this pose too much? Honest to God, I am not on my phone like that. I, my phone is on silent 24 seven every day of the year. It's on silent. I sometimes if I'm working at a coffee shop because the table, I can raise and lower my desk in my office, but at the, yeah. the table is much lower than my chair. Then I'm, I'm working like that, but I don't, I don't use my phone in that fashion. How much of the day do you spend out of the house percentage wise? Twenty 
20. Because one of the reasons I stopped using this physical book, uh, and I'll, I'll plug the brand, it's Code and Quill. They're about $35 for a quarterly journal. Uh, part of the reason I stopped using it was because when I stopped being in a bunch of different places and I was mostly at home, I, it, so what if I have the thing with me? Like I have, I have my laptop, I have my phone, I have total access to Google Docs. And Google Docs has the advantage of being able to change the template when it's not working and uh, tie into calendar appointments directly. Uh, it's just, it was just the, the benefit of I can hold this thing was outweighed by a variety of very obvious digital benefits. Yeah, for sure. So would you say then that Google Docs is uh, your substitution for the quarterly journal? So what happened was I stopped doing the I stopped doing the quarterly journal and didn't really formally replace it with anything. Like I just don't have a daily did I do these tasks. So I don't I don't do a checklist each day of did I practice Spanish, uh, you know, did I play guitar, did I ride my bike. And one of the things that was useful about this was as it, as I was trying to establish, you know, explicit guitar practice or as I was trying, you know, I I had a, I had eyeballed an e-bike and I really wanted an e-bike, but it was kind of expensive and I already had three bikes. So I just wrote down every single day. One of the goals was ride your bike. And I figured after nine weeks of riding my bike every day, I'll probably ride the e-bike and not just have it sit there as a thing that I thought I wanted, but I'm actually not going to use. So nine weeks later, I'd ridden my bike most days, bought the e-bike and I ride the e-bike most days. And it was like, it was a, it made that whole decision much less about consuming and the purchase of the bike and the thrill of, Hey, I got a new thing. It was much more about like, are you a bike person now? Is biking a thing that you do as opposed to a thing that you're imagining yourself gonna do? See in my neighborhood, um, I, I, I won't name the neighborhood, but it, it's probably fairly easy to figure out. Um, but I live in a neighborhood that was built, modeled after a live work environment. Mm -hmm. And there's a, an example of it in Florida that I can't remember the name of it, but it's, everything's walkable, uh, but it's grown, uh, quite a bit. So every, everyone has golf carts. And so it, I can't bring myself to buy a golf cart. Um, I just can't do it. <laughs> but I also can't, I can't bring myself to get a bike either. I just drive my overpriced golf cart. Golf cart. Yeah. Well, so then, then you have to ask yourself, do you, do you need another thing? No. And that's why I don't do it. And it's like, I, I'm not participating in your thing, fellow citizens of this neighborhood. I'm not participating in that. It, it's just not my thing. You'll see, like you pull up, there's across the street, my friend owns a wine bar and, uh, it's a neat, neat place wins awards every year for Louisville, but there are always like golf carts lined up down the street parked to go into this place. And it's, it is what it is to each his own, but it's not, I've been asked more times than I care. Why don't you have a golf cart? It's funny how quickly things can change from no one in your life has ever asked you, why don't you have a golf cart to a lot of people asking why you don't have a golf have cart. Have you ever played golf? Yeah. Yeah. I like golf. Never played. Wow. Ne never. I have never played one time. I want to go learn how to swing just to do it. Uh, but I, I, you'll never catch. That's one of those things like skiing. It, it the, the, the barrier for entry is too high. So high. Yeah. So I, the, I, it, the way I got into golf, I'm not, I'm not into golf. I don't own clubs. I haven't golfed in years, but the way I got interested in playing golf was playing municipal courses. Mm. So I, my buddy lived in Baltimore and we played a couple of par three courses in Baltimore and walked them. And so the cost of like a round of golf is 30 to $40. Uh, they have clubs that you can rent, but they're going to be like odds and ends. It's not going to be, yeah. I paid a hundred dollars for late model titleists. Uh, I don't know that I ever saw anyone in the current years 
spikes and most of the people i saw golfing were wearing <laughs> basketball shorts and sneakers um i mean downside to this is there's a lot of debauchery and like low low grade not not upper crust like i'm wearing my golf polo and this is a big outing with me and the boys and we're gonna go and have a Your wild deals. time yeah right no this is like <laughs> this is like i'm out here and i'm i came to get drunk and just sort of be outside for a while and blow off work and i'm gonna destroy some property just to destroy uh, some property type of stuff yeah but i mean but the people that are going there most are the people that are golfing a lot and are just spending their time at the course who you know buy in bulk it's not really a membership deal because it's a city course but you know the grounds are not meticulous they're they're playable but anybody who's got a country club membership would be like why would i ever golf here and i'd be like well how good are you at golf if you're good enough if you're good enough to where you're too good for this course fantastic go have your country club but if you are not good enough to be too good for this because you know you just don't like that the grass is not as green literally not as green or smooth yeah. i mean do you really love the game or do you love the vibe of being in a closed off gated enclave of of quasi outdoors how where did, other people can't get in how did golf evolve as such a regal seemingly it's an american thing well, i thought it was in english i thought it was, yeah, right golf is from the british isles yeah but golf as snooty aristocratic yeah yeah that was all us <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah of golf course <laughs> so yeah I, I i like to golf but not because of any of the other stuff i described i like it because it, it's one of the hardest things that i it's one of the things that i am worst at in the entire world that i can still extract enjoyment from i've heard that yeah i've heard a, i've heard a lot of people the comment that i hear from a lot of people who play even if it's a casual uh interest all the way through people who play a lot. It, one of the things they say is there's always the one shot. You're terrible the entire time, but there's the one shot that makes you want to keep doing it. And the, the pros will duff one or two in 18 holes and you will get one or two good ones right. in 18 holes. Right. And the, that's the big difference between them and you. And it only takes feeling like you, you got it right a few times to be like, I just want to keep coming out here and doing this more. The interesting thing that I read about golf, um, maybe it was Tiger's father. One of the famous prodigies father taught them to play golf by putting first and then working backwards through the clubs. And, um, which I, I, I you know, presumably cause a lot of the training now there's a lot of machine learning and data-based training in golf as well, which I enjoy. But a lot of the training is how far can you hit it? You know, how, how aggressively you swing that sort of thing. But the, the article, the point of the article was the most important thing on the golf course is to putt. Um, and Tiger's father, presumably, I think it's him taught him to putt first and then work backwards through the clubs. I think the most important thing is to have fun and try hard for sure. Yeah. And to give you a sense of how you've got to have the right clothes though. I mean, you've got to be, you know, no. you've got to, no. it's got to be, the fit has to be on point. No, just wear whatever. Um, to tell you what level of seriousness of golfer is, I, a golfer I have been m on more than one occasion. I, so, so you're talking about learning the clubs backwards on more than one occasion. I have golfed with a half or a quarter set of clubs because it, doesn't weigh as much to carry <laughs> that's fair and on more than one occasion other people in my group have golfed with three clubs that they held in their hands and that was their call that was their equipment <laughs> yeah I, I, that sounds like the the course that i would take all right we'll, we'll go golfing it, it's also very i mean it's super time consuming that's it, the know, other thing holy cow like yeah. it is it is a commitment you have to go to a special place and the worse you are like me, the longer it takes. So like, I, you know, if I gave myself a hard time timeline, like I can only play for so-and-so amount of time, I might not actually even be able to finish the game of golf. 
Well, it's the same thing for me with skiing. I, I've done it a few times, but it, it I guess it's fun. Um, but it's just the barrier for entry. It's, it's at least a half an hour, 45 minute drive from wherever you are, unless you're staying at Breckenridge or one of those places and you're, you're you know, like a ski out kind of situation. Right. Like it's a long drive to get to the place, then to get from your place, the car, the parking lot to the equipment, get the equipment on fitted, dressed, and then down it, it's there for me, the, the enjoyment is, doesn't offset the barrier for entry. It's so too my, much. Work. My brother and his, um, my brother and his wife live in Portland in the city and they discovered the municipal golf course equivalent of skiing. So less than an hour and 15 minute drive, you know, they can decide they want to go skiing and do a night session for two and a half to three hours of skiing. Um, and they have lift, lift tickets for the season and they bought all their own gear. So they, so once you have the stuff, you, the stuff goes from car to lift and that's it. And you save 30 to 45 minutes of goofing off and, and getting fitted and finding rental stuff and all that. Uh, so that compresses it a lot. And then knowing that you're going to go, you know, every weekend for the entire season and having the season depend on, uh, natural snow and temperatures also is a bigger factor. And then knowing that all the people that are serious about skiing aren't skiing there, like they yeah. all, they all went to Vail and yeah. they went to Aspen and they are just not skiing on that particular mountain. Yeah. Now the thing that I would buy that's a high barrier to entry because you'd have to travel and it's expensive, that sort of thing are jet skis. Um, I did that for the first time. I took the kids to the beach this summer and uh, we jet skied and had an absolute blast. One of the funnest things I've ever done. I would buy those. Um, but around here, that would require going to a lake. The closest lake is my parents live by one. It's like 40 minutes away. Um, so that would be a high barrier to entry, too. But that would be fun for me. We talked about wanting to live, uh, wanting to summer at the lake. For sure. One of the reasons I want to summer at the lake is so that my jet ski is right there, not on a trailer exactly. that has to come out of the backyard, that has to get hitched up, that has to go to the launch, that has to go in the water, that has to be parked in the parking lot. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I guess I'm a hypocrite because that barrier for entry is not too high for me and it's no, no less significant. I think that honestly, I think the hypocrisy is given, given the number of, of ways in which you think, or you've expressed to me that society is in decline. I think that, that holding those positions while also being an enthusiastic jet skier <laughs> is, is somewhat, <laughs> hypocritical potentially yeah well i don't can i qualify can can you classify me as an enthusiastic jet skier uh if i've only done it one time i don't know man you came out of the gate real strong <laughs> with your take on jet skis i i you have thoroughly to, you, enjoyed it you need to you need to dig deep and find a curmudgeonly hatred of enjoyment of jet skis no i have a hard right. time hating anything except digital twins oh geez <laughs> All right, so so my my notebook went away, and I half heartedly digitized everything. I found so I the there's a guy who directs movies, Robert Rodriguez. He's known for the Spy Kids franchise. He did a double feature type movie with Quentin Tarantino, um, Death Proof, and the other one. He didn't do Death Proof. He did the other one. Uh, he also directed the Mariachi trilogy. Uh, he kind of became known because when he when he made El Mariachi, he did it for basically the lowest budget that any quasi popular movie had ever been made for at the time in the I guess early '90s. And listening to him describe, and I think he's kind of playing up how cheaply he made this movie. But when he looks back on it years or decades later and talks about what his thinking was as he was making El Mariachi, he was like, I just took what I had and made that into the thing that was in the movie. So there's kind of a big central scene that involves, I guess, like a bus chase or something like that. And his explanation of why there's a bus in the movie is because he had a bus, like a guy that he knew had access to a bus. And he was like, right, we're having a bus in the movie. And this is not a director or writer who 
who is going to go down in the annals of film history as like a true auteur. And, you know, this guy is not going to be, he's, he's no Orson Welles, but his movies are enjoyable. And he has made a full career out of making movies, having decided that he wanted to make movies. So, you know, that's nothing to sneeze at. And he's consistently made movies that are successful at the box office and critically mixed, but not universally hated. Apparently kids love spy kids, but my kids are, it was way too, too, too early for my kids to have gotten into them. So anyway, his, he explained on some, some, I was listening to him, uh, on an interview. He's like, Oh, I take Like I journal really, really aggressively. Somebody's like, what's your, what do you use to journal? Do you keep a, you know, it was like, what's your, what's your quarterly notebook deal? He's like, Oh, I don't, I don't really have that. I just, I use my laptop. You know, and I remember, you know, he, he said, I remember back so-and-so year, sometime in the mid nineties, he got an early, like a clamshell Mac. It wasn't called a MacBook even then. It was, it was some other version of Mac. He's like, so I just had a word processor on it. And then I just have a bazillion word, word documents or whatever. And he couldn't even name what the, what the, what the software was that he'd used for it. He's just like, oh, I have all these things that I wrote on my computer. <laughs> And it was such an anti, such an anti tool stance and such a pro process stance that it has stuck with me for a very long time, even so, though I've never gotten to anything close to his level of, you know, daily, daily journaling. Is that where you come down then? What do you mean? A, a heavy process stance and the tool is trivial. I mean, tools get better over time for the most part, but the basic principles of what am I trying to accomplish and, uh, and what's going to, what is going to work for that purpose, that, that iterative, you know, test and experimentation, I think is the part that's important. So, uh, other tools that I have used a lot, um, dictating to my iPhone. So, being able to while walking a dog i don't have a dog now but while i had a dog being able to hold a button on the phone and then say remind me to schedule a thing with terry or remind me to give medicine to the dog or remind me to pick up more toilet paper and have that be the the time from thought to a place where it existed that would be able to be referred to was more or less instantaneous and I was kind of running away from watching other people who struggled with, you know, I'd be mid conversation with some of these people and they'd be like, oh shoot, I just forgot about blah, blah thing. And I'm like, how? I mean, it's, you don't have to remember it, but why is there no process to, you know, at noon, we check our inbox at four o'clock. We make sure our to-do list is complete for the, for the stuff that we're supposed to have done today at 9 PM. We check the schedule for the next day. And it, it wasn't, they weren't forgetting because they have a bad memory. They were forgetting because they have a bad system. You know what I mean? So I'd say I fall very heavily towards, there are some amazing tools. No user has control over, like the tool is never going to be enough. You always have to be thinking in terms of the system. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I've lived that as well. There's a little four track app for iOS called MTSR and um, I have that on my phone and just, I don't know how, I guess I got tired of losing ideas, um, but I have that on the ready. So if there's a melody, I've literally used that tens of times just for melodies or a guitar riff that I like or in the off chance that lightning strikes and both happen at the same time, um, I capture it on that app. And so I've built the past two records have all gone through that exclusively. So you can, you can cut four tracks. So I'll do that. I'll, I'll cut the rhythm track and then go back and do a vocal track. No click, no nothing, just raw as hell. Um, but I've used that extensively in that exact same fashion. And so that's a, that's a four track audio recorder. Correct. Yeah, correct. It just uses your phone's, uh, mic capabilities and captures whatever's in the room. No filters, no, I mean, it's, it's very, very raw, but that's my musical journaling equivalent to what you just explained. There's a, I'll link to this in the, in the kind of show notes, but there in 2017, um, 
Kendrick Lamar released a hit album. It was uh, largely produced by Steve Lacey, a guitar player and production whiz kid, super young, super talented. And kind of after the album had gotten a lot of accolades, it became apparent and somebody found out that one of Steve Lacey's primary tools was his phone. In the sen- and, not, and when I say his phone, it was whatever crusty old broken screen iPhone he already had. He did not procure a phone for the right. sake of production. It was the thing that was in his pocket. And he had a, a previous version of an interface so he could plug his guitar into his phone that was not made anymore. So he has this, he has this out, it wasn't vintage, it was just a couple of years old, but it was like, he has this digital tool chain of guitar to God awful dongle thingy to (laughs) crummy phone. And like, it's just, he's always making the music, right? Like he, he's never not thinking about or coming up with music. And because he's always coming up with it and the phone is always there, that's the way that he, you know, that was his workflow. And it had not like the, the the tooliness of it was not there is a tool that works this way and it's not like you should say oh well let's package up steve lacy's production magic into an app and we'll get it behind you know we'll have him sponsor the new app that's going to make all these other producers be able to work that this way no that's the steve way and it works because of steve not because of the app so if you remember and i have a couple of thoughts on that first is just real quickly i don't know if you like a band called unknown mortal orchestra but yeah i like them very, it's um, oh, it's what's his name? Very similar it's story, Mad Lab, right? Uh, I don't know the guy's name. I really, really, really like that first record, though. But it's the same story with the, the same same kind of story with him. And um, he posted, you know, some stuff that he basically was just ca- captured in similar fashion. Posted it to SoundCloud, um, and it blew up. Oh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of yesterday's new quintet, which is a different a different band. Sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's one thought. But if you remember, um, actually, probably the first week we started doing this, and I we we talked a lot about AI and and data science at scale, and I just thought of this: uh, a lot of what I said from an execution of AI within the enterprise f- mirrors exactly what you just explained, and it's the fact that it's a discipline. It's a it's a it's not a piece of software you don't buy into you know b- improving profitability with ai it's a discipline and whatever tools you have on hand is a great place to start the problem is is the the subject matter expertise that can use whatever tools are at hand there aren't enough really good uh, kendrick lamar guitarists in enterprise to execute ai that way i have a i have a specific sort of I have, I have, I have a handful of these sort of pet, pet tools. Um, and some of them are more of an issue. Some of them are more of a tool. Some of them are more of a workflow thing, but I, I basically like my entire livelihood has depended on digitizing factory operations. So that means, that means applying software and networking tools to, you know, sometimes analog stuff, sometimes digital stuff. A lot of times it's just outdated digital stuff. So think about the the old version of phone with old version of dongle. Now turn that into a nuclear power plant or, uh, you know, a switching station or something. And it's like, oh, well, it's already digital, but it's the 1986 version of digital. And we have to do something about maintaining this forever uh, until the end of time. What are we going to do to like layer another piece of digital modernity on that. So one of the things that ha- has come up over and over and over again, and I think it does for most people that are in a similar space to where you and I have been working, is like paper versus digital, which is the world's most false comparison. <laughs> like it, it just it's not that is there is no versus there. And the the example of this that comes up that is that I would say is my pet tool or my pet workflow is Paper has a role as a way to consume information if that's the best way to consume information. So if I'm if I'm in a machine shop and the machine shop has always and since forever had a piece of paper that is, you know, taped or sitting in a bin 
with a set of raw material and that piece of paper is the instructions on what's supposed to happen to this raw material and then the notes being marked up on that are what has changed along the process that's called a, a paper traveler and there is no there is no inherent reason that a digital traveler is superior to paper traveler for the purpose of consumption at the machine right so having no record of what was on that on that traveler in a computer system is insanity but assuming that the way to have that traveler is we're going to put an ipad instead of a piece of paper why i mean the paper costs nothing and the thing that's missing is okay so i make notes on the paper how do those notes get reflected back into the, the current digital reality and thinking about it as a paper versus not paper argument completely misses the point so think about when you i mean you don't strike me as a Starbucks drinker. Do you go to any place that sells hot drinks in paper cups? Yeah, I have a we have a coffee shop here in the neighborhood that's really good. Do they write on the cup? No. How do you how do they know whose cup is whose? Uh What is it that I usually get? Um some kind of tea, whatever tea. Blank and blank tea with two stevia for Terry. That's how they do it. How did, out, how, out so is there, and, and, and you get this in what kind of a cup? Paper, paper cup. Paper cup. And is there any marking that indicates this is your drink? No. Is there a receipt slipped under the drink or is there, there is a not. spot? It's no. just memory. It's it's just memory. Skill. Yeah. This is the most Terry ass place I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> you can so the coffee shop that I go to most <laughs> often uh, I don't want a paper cup <laughs> because I get overpriced espresso drinks and they taste better out of ceramic. Well, plus so, all that it, paper cups are terrible for you anyway. Anyway. Right. So I want to drink out of a real cup. And the way that they, they associate my order is a number. I get one tag handed to me. And the other half of that number, like an old school uh, raffle ticket type system, but on a receipt, the other half of that is printed off and goes onto my cup. It doesn't, it's not stuck to my cup. It is slipped on between the cup and the plate. And that is the, you know, traveler for my cup of coffee. Now, if you go to big corporate coffee, Duncan, Starbucks, I'm a Duncan guy, not a Starbucks guy, because I like lighter roasts. Uh, they don't just slip the paper under the cup. They take a, a sticker receipt and the sticker yeah. receipt go, the, the paper on which your number is printed and your name is stuck directly to the cup. Now, if you're a manufacturing person, you already know where I'm going here, which is a sticky printer as a way to consume the information of this is this is order number X and needs to be associated with this person. And there's a gap between person places order. Other people will process the things that, that go into this order and those all need to be bundled up together and delivered to that same person who told me a thing. And then a bunch of stuff happens in the background. So sticking a piece of paper with that information directly to the thing that they're eventually going to consume is very lean. It's the right way to be doing this. It is a completely appropriate application of paper and digitizing that in some way is torturing the actual process just to make it digital and i don't think it would work the the thing the thing that ties it together though is like that record of what happened it's just an output of the point of sale system so the cash register gets the information uh you know that information is then printed out into words and the 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 item of record is not that little piece of paper that's stuck to your cup that's just one piece of reporting that comes out of the system of record and thinking in terms of there's a digital system of record that exists forever for all orders. And there is also a paper component to that, which is a, how do I consume the information that exists inside the system of record, being able to disambiguate those and create two separate concerns there rather than say, all it's digital. All still, yeah, like we're, yeah. it's not paper versus digital. It's completely the wrong way to be thinking about that problem. So how do you, how do you, as a parallel thought experiment with medical charting, bedside medical charting, very similar process? Okay, has, so the, the first thing you have to do there is you have to hire a consulting company. McKinsey. Have you, oh, and by the way, you've got to Google I've this. It. I've seen it. How amazing is that? I love it. I, anyway. It kinda, I, honestly, it kind of hurt. It just felt like a lot of too true 
Yeah, it's a hundred percent true. Anyway, we'll we'll not uh, belabor those points. My so my my closest to a this is a, this is a, like a not I would say this isn't really a success story. So my closest substitute for physical notebook for you know how am I doing today? Did I take a journal? Like, do, am I journaling? Am I giving like a status report? The thing that I'd spend it, spend a lot of time on in the quarterly journal was did I do the tasks that I want to be routine? So we, you know, I signed up for a three month experiment on transcendental meditation. And that would be the place where I check two times a day, did my meditation, did my meditation. Uh, and that would be right next to, did I ride my bike? But I found that I didn't really need that daily checking off exercise. And it wasn't really helpful to check the same thing off every single day. Duolingo does it for me automatically, right? Like I either did it or I didn't. And having an additional step to check off, did I do the thing or did I did I not do the thing? It felt like overhead, not like a okay, helpful so, reflection. So hold on, because yeah. I want I want your input on this. I that totally makes sense. And I'm I'm in agreement with you on that. What I need that capacity for is I have things say, uh, and we kind of alluded to this previously, but say I have X thing, which has a bunch of steps required for work, let's call it work that I want to get done. And let's say I have three or four work type things where I've got multiple tasks that need to be done to get me to this incremental progress that I want to achieve with that thing. I've got daily tasks that I, I, I need to find some system for here's X thing. Here are the five days of this week. What tasks need to happen on these days to give me X incremental progress? And that's what I need the tool for is to it's as much a brainstorming capability or a, a delineation of tasks to achieve an outcome that I need. I can remember the I've got thing to do, thing to do, thing to do personally, you know, like individually, how do I, how do I construct my day? What I need it for is what I just explained, but then how does that fit into the broader scheme of the day? So if I've got two hour work bursts that I'm doing from say five to 7 AM, what do I need to do from five to 7 AM task wise? How do I, how do I make all those pieces align? Because that's where I find, that's where I find myself now too many, too many, um, open-ended tasks that aren't making their way to a trackable mechanism. I have good news and bad news. Oh, I don't want the bad news. I want you to give me <laughs> glowing <laughs> reports here. This is what this is for. Um, well, okay. So, I mean, the good news is any tool applied regularly will get you incremental progress there. So that means that you really don't have to spend anything for this tool. Uh, things that come to mind are uh, Trello, uh, which is a checklisting tool. Um, the the reminders app inside, uh, inside the Apple ecosystem. So you can make a reminder with a voice reminder. You can uh, indent them and put, put reminders under milestones. Uh, you can easily see across all devices. So whether you're on your computer, your phone, or your iPad, you can see the same list, assuming you're signed in with, um, with your Apple ID. So any of those really are probably going to be sufficient. The understanding, you know, when are you going to be looking at what do you need to do? So, so let's say, so let's say a typical day has three, uh, deep focus chunks. Like I'm just making that up as a number, but say you're gonna have three, two hour blocks where you do a thing and you need to know in the morning or the night before, what are the three things I'm going to do the next day? So your first, the very first thing you do either Sunday afternoon or Monday morning is you have to make a two hour block for organizing the rest of the two hour blocks, yeah. which is annoying, but it's worth it. Um, and that, is the first thing you can do. And when, and now or two, the tool is kind of suggesting itself, which is the very first thing to do is assuming you run your day on a digital calendar, block off a two hour block on the morning of the beginning of the week or afternoon at the end of the week. And that's your, that's your scheduling, you know, that's your, your task prioritization time and anything you do in that time that is progressing you towards task prioritization for the week is going to be a sufficient start. 
because now you've actually carved out the time and it'll either work and you'll love it and keep doing it. Or you'll feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I wasted an entire you know focus session just on this. I got to do a better job of this. And that will cause you to focus on how to make it work better. I like it. There's a, the, this is the equivalent life hack to if somebody has general dissatisfaction with their station in life, my answer is usually, <coughs> well, you should, you should find more aspirational friends. Just find the people that, whose life looks like yours does. Spend as much time as possible with them. Don't worry too much about the rest of it. And in six months, you'll be feeling a lot better. Yeah. So that that's, uh, you're, I, I think you're like 50% serious with that, but I think that's a real thing. Um, and again, it's I'm not serious about telling someone that their current friends are bad and that they should get better friends. That's very mean spirited, but the no. actual task is the same thing. But there, the flip side of that is true though. If, if you're trying, if you feel like, you, and I'm living this, if you feel like you're, you're here and not that you want to be better than the people that you're friends with, I've had the same group of friends for forever. Like I have a, a handful of really close friends that have been close friends my entire life, but I, I, I call it a mentor or, or somebody who's gone through what I'm trying to do. People who are, um, uh, who've accomplished what you want to accomplish or who, who have sort of mastered lack of a better term, mastered a skill that you want to develop, whether that's a physical discipline or whatever, those are people to socialize with. And, and I think by osmosis or by default, or just, you know, the, the normal course of interaction with human people, with human beings, you get, a lot of the benefits of the, the learnings from what they've experienced. And that helps you in your own journey. This is where the bad news comes in. Okay. And I'm going to tell you whether you want to hear it or not. Uh, hit me. I, you are not going to be able to double dip and simultaneously make a podcast and learn by osmosis, how I organize my week in that way. It's because I, I'm not a person who's mastered it. Yeah. I have, I have techniques. I have, I am active in, um, paying attention to that and I'm, I okay. make many attempts, but okay. I'm not there. So that is the point of this whole conversation is exactly what you just said. You've given me some tips to go be curious and figure out what works for me. Yeah. And that's how this works. That's how it works with diet, <laughs> with physical activity, with, with everything that it, someone might need to be disciplined about. The onus is still on you, the individual to do the detective work, to turn over rocks and figure out what pieces of what you've been shown work for you and how. And so I, I go into it with that mindset. Like you're not going to give me a finished product and it's going to change my thought on being organized. You've given me some places to start to do my own discovery. It's so it's also a, it's a social learning progression, right? So I am a year deep into being a, a solo operator as a job. And I had, I would say two very close and explicit people who I was following on that path. And I had at least weekly conversations with them about what does it mean to be working for yourself? And that has been consistent over the entire year that I've been working for myself. Prior to that, I had peers who were sort of side by side where I never really had an explicit conversation about freelancing or working for yourself, uh, but they were freelancing while I was not. And it was an ever present part of just the understanding of how, the, how those people work and live. And so there was, a, there was a very clear progression of I'm observing it, I'm observing it, I'm observing it, I'm being coached on it, I'm being coached on it, I'm being coached on it. At some point, I will be doing, you know, coaching on it, and I will also be, you know, just doing it. Uh, so it's a it's a super logical progression, and you're all you're doing is just sort of picking up the same stuff that a year ago somebody else was telling me. And to the extent that you're, you know, a solo operator, it's it's like here is the stuff that that was my brain dump from somebody else who'd been doing it longer. I'm going to hand that to you, and then you also need to go find somebody that's been at okay. this for eight years and talk to them quite, you know, very regularly and just see what they have to say. So I think that's a key point. We're in the middle of a uh, discipline discussion, but I think that's a key point is no one is going to give anyone else a completed blueprint on how to improve X. 
it doesn't work like that. Like there's a, there's a definite uh, obligation on the individual to sort of assimilate the different pieces of information into a working strategy that, that provides the, the, the outcomes that that individual is looking for. And I think that's a very important point about discipline. Still a lot of self-discovery involved. The discipline of self-discovery. Let's put a bow on it. I feel like that's a good ending. Yeah. All I'm right. Sen- I'm going to send this out. Go <laughs> real deep. Hold on. I got to turn it back up. Oh, it's coming in. Oh, there it is. Whoa. It's too slow though. Let's see if we can make it faster. Yeah. Increase the, the delay speed. I think the conclusion here is that I don't know how to play a synthesizer. See you next time, Terry. Have a good one.